How many Miami Hurricanes starting jobs are going to be up for grabs when fall camp begins? You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Monday, if there is such a thing. I'm Alex Dono, University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet and contributor to allhurricanes.com. And thank you so much to the everydayers for making Locked on Canes your first listen. We are available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. So it's not been officially announced yet, but the understanding is fall camp for the Miami Hurricanes is going to be opening up on August 1st. That means we're less than two weeks away. Less than two weeks away from fall camp, less than a month and a half away from actually playing games again in 2023. We've almost made it, guys. And we're opening up this episode of Locked on Canes to questions. You guys have been asking away in our subtext community and on Twitter. You can follow us at Locked on Canes and we'll follow you back. We get this one from Colby on subtext who says, hey, as we approach fall camp, what are some position battles to look for? And do you see anyone taking over a certain position group or do you think our depth chart is set in stone? And he says, in addition, which groups are the most volatile? Well, Colby, the depth chart is definitely not set in stone. There are a lot of spots up for grabs, which to me makes this upcoming fall camp really exciting. I can't wait to watch it. I think the only positions that are basically set in stone are quarterback with Tyler Van Dyke, the majority of the offensive line, because you've got your starting center in Matt Lee, your starting left guard in Javion Cohen, probably your starting right guard in Inez Cooper, Uh, Zion Nelson, um, supposedly completely healthy now. If so, he's probably your starting left tackle. Francis Maui Noah, probably your starting right tackle. You know, I'm sure guys like McLaughlin and Washington will try to compete there. But for the most part, the offensive line looks pretty much set in stone. But the first spot that I'm going to look at, where there's definitely going to be some competition, is Mike Linebacker. Now, we've been gushing about Kiko Maui Noah, you know, the younger brother of CeCe, Francis, uh, Francisco Kiko is the older brother who transferred in from Washington State who had a really great spring at Mike Linebacker, but you know he still needs to officially beat out Corey Flagg for that spot. Uh, I think uh, outside linebacker, uh, weak side linebacker with uh, Wes Besaint is pretty, he's pretty secure in that spot, I think, but definitely going to be some competition at Mike Linebacker. There's going to be a ton of competition at cornerback. Now, how can there not be competition at corner when, you know, your two starting boundary guys both are off to the NFL? Uh, I'm pretty sure Devontae Brown is going to be one of the new cornerback starters, the transfer from UCF, but he's still got to solidify that in fall camp. And then on the other side, you know, you're going to have guys like Daryl Porter, who looked pretty good in spring, but then you've got newcomers who have arrived since spring like Jaden Davis, who transferred in from Oklahoma, Demetrius Freeney, who transferred in, Jadeus Richard, who transferred in, Chris Graves heading into his second year, if not more, competing for a starting job. So I think there's going to be a ton of battles to watch at cornerback. That's going to be a spot that's going to be fun to watch in practice. Uh, let's switch back to the offense. You know, at receiver, uh, the lock there would be Xavier Restrepo is a lock for the slot. I don't think anyone's beating him out. Um, Now, Colby Young probably has a starting wide receiver job locked down, probably, but there's going to be competition in that room because that room's got an injection of talent, right? And I think there's definitely going to be competition outside of Colby Young for the other starting job between Jacoby George, Tyler Harrell, and Shamar Kirk, uh, because I've... I've had it kind of penciled in like my my Dono depth chart. Maybe I'll, I'll publish that on the subtext if anyone wants to see it, you know, before fall camp begins. But on, on the Dono depth chart, you know, I've got Jacoby George probably holding down a starting spot heading into fall camp. But, you know, I was looking at the projected depth chart on Kane Sport this morning, the one that Matt Shodell puts together. And he's actually got and I'm not questioning it because there's going to be competition, but he's actually got Tyler Harrell who just transferred in from Alabama starting over Jacoby George. And I guess logically you could say Tyler Harrell, probably the fastest guy on the team or one of the two fastest guys, because Chris Johnson is also super speedy, uh, that it would make sense to have Harrell, you know, starting because he can stretch the field the way that he can. But that's absolutely got to be earned. And Jacoby George is the guy who's been around for the last couple of years. And I'm not sleeping on Shamar Kirk either. There's going to be a lot of competition at receiver. 
Running back is an interesting one. You know, I've got Henry Parrish penciled in. He's got the edge to be the running back starter when the season starts. Had an excellent spring, was pretty consistent last year, and the coaches trust him in pass protection. But the running back room looks pretty loaded after Parrish. The resurgence of Don Chaney Jr., the arrival of A.J. Allen from Nebraska, Mark Fletcher, I know he's a true freshman, but he's coming in to try to take somebody's job, and eventually that's going to be the starting running back. Whether it happens this year or next year or the year after that, Mark Fletcher is eventually going to be running back one at Miami, and at what point will Trevante Citizen be fully recovered? Because, you know, maybe that day's already come, maybe that day is yet to come, but that guy's going to factor into that decision as well. So there's definitely a lot to watch for at running back. You know, tight end, you would imagine Elijah Arroyo, if he's fully healthy, is going to be the top dog there. He is coming off a serious knee injury, though. Uh, there's plenty of depth behind him to push for that job. Uh, on the defensive line, there are no guarantees beyond Akeem Mesidor and Leonard Taylor. They should both be starters, but you've got plenty of other spots up for grabs there, right? You're going to have guys like Jared Harrison Hunt, Ahmad Moten, Branson Dean competing to start next to Leonard Taylor at defensive tackle. And on the edge, there's a ton of competition between Nigel Lee Kelly, who I probably have penciled in, but Jafari Harvey's been around forever. Reuben Bain is an up-and-comer, true freshman. You know, an X factor there, Cyrus Moss, still probably a little undersized, but he had a really good spring. So has he put on, you know, enough weight to really compete and get on the field consistently? So there's a lot of competition on the defensive line, although I do expect Leonard Taylor and Akeem Mesidor to both be starters. They have to be. Those guys are too good not to have on the field early and often, okay? So those are some of the battles that I'm looking at. And you guys let me know. Leave a comment, right, whether you want to tweet us at Locked on Canes or you want to leave us a YouTube comment, what you think are going to be the most bitter battles on the field for starting jobs come fall practice. I would love to hear from you guys, and maybe we'll revisit this topic later in the week. And do you agree with me that – you know, a handful of spots like quarterback with Tyler Van Dyke and the two safety spots, Cam Kinchins and James Williams. I don't think anyone's going to argue Cam has his spot locked down. But is anyone going to argue, you know, James Williams or Tyler Van Dyke having their starting jobs locked down? But long and the short of it is, guys, there are more spots up for grabs, I believe, than spots that already have starters locked in. So. There's going to be some survival of the fittest happening in fall camp coming up for the Miami Hurricanes, and I cannot wait to watch it. We're opening up to more of your questions on the other, on the other side. We got a lot of recruiting questions, like uh, about negative recruiting. What sort of cards other coaches are playing against Miami to try to get recruits Miami might be after, and how the recruits coming in, the tw class of 2024 guys, and even the 2023s that are about to be true freshmen, how these guys can be factors in the ultimate Miami Hurricanes rebuild if we actually want to get it right this time because we've been trying to get the rebuilds right for the better part of the last 20 years and we've always hit snags along the way. 2023 and the 2024 classes, are these going to be the ones to turn the U around for good? We are only getting started, my friends, right here. You want to keep it locked to Locked on Canes. I am only getting started on FanDuel, and you should as well. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in, in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks, and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run. And all of that, folks, is on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win... You get paid instantly. There is no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. I know my, my fellow South Floridians have been doing well overall betting on the Marlins. It's been a fun job so far this season. So you guys want to keep locked into that. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We are available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. Thank you to the everydayers. And if you want to take your everydayer experience to the next level, you want to join our exclusive SMS texting service through subtext. You get text messages to your phone directly from mine with recruiting scoops, 
show updates. You guys can ask me questions that we answer on the shows, or I can do one-on-ones with you right there on the subtext. We have a lot of fun. I'm including a link in the show description below on how you can sign up for our subtext community. You can try it free for 14 days, nothing to lose. And then if you like it, you can opt in for $4.99 a month. We give you a lot of added value on there. So check out the link in the show description below. And we're answering a lot of questions from the subtext today. Uh, let me see. Uh, there's a great question we had from Colby in the previous segment. Uh, this is a good one from our guy Lowell, who says, hey, what is one under-the-radar thing you're watching during fall camp from your friendly neighborhood Lowell? Well, okay, your first mistake, Lowell, you know how much I love to talk. If you're going to ask me to give you one thing, I'm going to give you 10, okay? Uh, but okay, if you're talking under the radar, an under the radar thing I'm going to be watching for in fall camp, how's this for under the radar? And no joke, I want to watch Dylan Joyce, the new punter. Lou Headley leaves big shoes to fill. And one of my regrets from all the spring practices that I covered was I didn't watch the punters enough just because where we were positioned on the field, I'm going to have binoculars this time around. I didn't have the uh, the binoculars or the opera glasses for spring football. I've already bought binoculars to bring to, to fall camp. So wherever Dylan Joyce is, no matter what corner of Green Tree he's on, I'm going to be watching Dylan Joyce because I want to see how the new Aussie punter compares to the old Aussie punter. So that's that's about as far under the radar as you can get when I'm out there watching punters. But no, overall, Lowell, Uh, A big thing that I want to see, and this is probably not under the radar, but this is going to be a big focus for me when I go out to fall camp. I want to really watch the true freshmen who weren't around for spring practice and also the transfers because a lot of transfers came in after spring. Guys that I haven't had a chance to see up against other Miami players in person because I'm going to get my first look at fall camp at guys like Damari Brown, Mark Fletcher, Tommy Kinsler, Robert Stafford, Joshua Horton. I'm going to be watching these guys compete in Kane's uniforms. I'm going to be watching Tyler Harrell out there and Shamar Kirk out there and Judeus Richard at corner. There's a lot of guys that are on the team now that were not on the team even, you know, three months ago up until the spring game. So these are going to be big focuses of mine. All right, for the next uh, few questions, we'll transition over to recruiting. Now, I should mention this was not a surprise. It doesn't mean I'm happy about it, but this was not a surprise on Saturday night. Uh, when Miami did not win the commitment of four-star tight end Caleb Odom. Odom chose the Alabama Crimson Tide. If you've watched and listened to this show for you know the past month or so, we've told you that Odom had been trending heavily to Alabama. We did get a glimmer of hope, though, in late June. We got a glimmer of hope in late June because Odom really did have a positive visit to Miami on the June 23rd weekend with guys like Judd Anderson, the ambassador, in his ear. And it is my understanding, for what it's worth, um, Miami did make a bit of a surge for Odom, but the Crimson Tide ultimately ended up being the spot for him. And, you know, listen, I know if you subscribe to the whole Ricky Bobby school of recruiting, if you're not first, you're last. It's not really the same these days when it because you think about transfer portal and flips and how many guys change their minds. And I'm not saying Caleb Odom is going to flip. I'm just saying big picture wise. Coming in second place in someone's recruiting is, you know, not not as negative as you think, because if that player does have any second thoughts, if you came in second place, you never know. And we know Mario Cristobal and his staff, they never stop grinding. They never stop working and they never stop recruiting. So ultimately, I'm not saying Caleb Odom's going to be a cane. I think he's going to end up being a member of the Alabama Crimson Tide. But when it comes to recruiting, you never give up. And I know I know Mario Cristobal never gives up. All right. Uh, But uh, we get a question from Mike L who says, how important is the Miami Gardens Ravens connection in the pursuit of Jeremiah Smith and LeWayne McCoy? Uh, He also asks, has the IMG pipeline been affected by David Stone's recruitment of his teammates? Um, Okay, so let me start with the Miami Gardens Ravens. Uh, Absolutely. I think more so even for LeWayne McCoy right now, who's verbally committed to Florida State. Miami's already landed a ton of Miami Gardens Ravens, these guys who played youth football together in that powerhouse optimist program. Right. You know, you've got Vincent Shavers and Ryan Mack and O.J. Frederick and Jojo Trader now from Miami Gardens Ravens. And these guys, they still have that bond. Right. Because anytime one of those little Ravens commit somewhere, you know, Jeremiah Smith and all these guys are retweeting each other and they're celebrating each other. You know, I I think there's definitely, there's definitely some smoke to the idea 
that Miami is – they're working. I believe that they're working to try to flip four-star wide receiver Luane McCoy from his Florida State verbal commitment. Uh, they're definitely chipping away there. We'll see what happens. I We also know, of course, Miami has not stopped recruiting Jeremiah Smith, who's, I think, for my money, the best overall player in the class, not the best receiver. I think Jeremiah Smith is the best overall player in the class of 2024. Um, he's currently committed to Ohio State. And Ohio State, they're doing everything they can to keep that young man locked in. And we all know what a great recruiter Brian Hartline is, that wide receivers coach. You know, if Miami's got anything working for them, well, they got two things working for them. The hometown factor and the Miami Gardens Ravens factor, because Jeremiah Smith was part of that group as well. So um, Buckeyes, to me, still the prohibitive favorite until proven otherwise. And he's already verbally committed there. Uh, but definitely, I, I think that the Miami Gardens Ravens connection could be a factor with both of them. I think Luane McCoy even more so than with Jeremiah Smith. Uh, as far as the IMG pipeline, listen, um, so it, it feels like David Stone, who who loves Oklahoma, he's not officially verbally committed to Oklahoma yet. But it's I don't know, it's kind of uh, one of the worst kept industry secrets that Jaden Jackson, who just committed to Oklahoma out of IMG Academy last week. They kind of feel like Jaden Jackson and David Stone are a package deal and that they're both going to go to Oklahoma together. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess you could say that, that, uh, you know, M Miami, you know, they did not land uh, Jarrett Gibson, the running back from IMG, although it's my understanding they preferred Kevin Riley. So they got the guy they wanted more than Gibson. Uh, but definitely Miami would have taken Jaden Jackson they would take David Stone who's a five star and so yeah I guess you could say that you know last year it was the IMG Miami pipeline so far this year it's looking more like the IMG Oklahoma pipeline but listen pipelines are great and Miami is definitely they're going to land more IMG players in the future it's it's going to happen but if you're talking about pipelines I think the ones in your own area codes right the 305 up to the 954 uh, I think those are even more important, and we're seeing Miami do some positive work there. In fact, we get a question about that from Ardry from Pensacola, who says, hey, has Mario Cristobal repaired the recruiting pipelines in South Florida since he arrived? Um, it sure looks that way, Ardry. Like, I, I can't think of any schools that that Mario has had negative progress with. I, I think uh, I've seen a lot of, of positives. Uh, Miami has started landing a lot more players from American Heritage and St. Thomas Aquinas again. Those were problem areas for Miami in recent years. They couldn't land enough guys from those schools. Uh, you know, last year you, you got, uh, what, Damari Brown and uh, Mark Fletcher, most notably from Heritage. The STA pipeline is growing leaps and bounds even more so this year. You have Chance Robinson, O.J. Frederick, Ryan Mack in this class already. Um, you know, obviously Mario Cristobal being a Columbus alum, along with Alex Mirabal and Alonso Highsmith, is a big factor. And you're landing more players from Miami Central as well. So Miami Central and Columbus, American Heritage, St. Thomas Aquinas. You know, there I'm sure there are others I'm leaving out. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's safe to say that Cristobal is uh, is doing – you're not landing everybody. Like, there are, you know, plenty of South Florida kids that, that are still leaving, unfortunately. But I think you're doing a good job repairing some of those relationships. We get a question from Donnie Q, who says, How do we get back to glory? And how does this class and last year's class fit into it? Okay, Don Q, if you want to know how to get Miami to the level that Georgia's at right now, the level that Alabama had been at for many years, right? The level Miami used to be at 20 plus years ago. How do you get back to that? The most important way to get back to that is stacking talent, creating competition on your roster, but finding alpha dogs. Not only finding great players, but great players with the right personality. Because it's a bigger problem in 2023 than it was in 1983 in filtering out divas, right? There's a lot more divas out there playing high school football than there was 30, 40 years ago, right? Because social media, NIL, like, you, you know, you have to be, I, I think you have to use even more discretion now when you're trying to find not only the right athletes, but the right human beings, which is such a big emphasis from Alonzo Highsmith. Uh, so. That's one of the reasons why I praise the 2023 class so much. The class of 2023, the guys who are coming in to be true freshmen this year, it could go down as the most important recruiting class of the last 20 plus years for Miami. 
because a big thing about 2023, which is a top seven recruiting class, best recruiting class Miami has had in a long time. But I've been told repeatedly that the Miami staff feels like this 2023 class top to bottom is made up 100 percent of players that are not only good athletes, great athletes, but they have the right attitude and the love for football that Alonzo Highsmith and Mario Cristobal look for. That these guys legitimately want to bring Miami back to the top of the food chain, and they're willing to work hard to do it. This is a conversation we had a week or two ago with Brian Monroe talking about this 2023 class. You know, obviously Mario Cristobal and Alex Mirabal, the time that they spent in Oregon, uh, the time Mario spent at Alabama back in the day. He's obviously seen some incredible recruiting classes when it comes to pure talent, all right? And that Mario feels like, and this is not, Mario didn't tell me this directly. This is secondhand information, just FYI. But I was told that Mario feels like, hey, he's had classes previous to 2023 that on paper were probably more talented. And you may have classes in the future after 2023 that on paper are more talented. But that he never has felt like he's had a class this good when it comes to the right personality traits, the alpha dogs, guys who are bought in and have the work ethic necessary. So they feel really, really strongly about the class of 2023. And, you know, hopefully we get more of the same in 2024. I mean, 2024 to me, you know, Miami now trending very positively because, you know, people were freaking out because a week ago they were ranked, you know, in the 20s. Uh, and, you know, they get a couple of really strong commits late last week. Five-star JoJo Trader, four-star Otavius Jones. Suddenly Miami's in the top 15 now and climbing. There you have the number 14 ranked class in America, according to 24 uh, seven. But I can't give a full comment on the class of 2024 because it's not done yet. Right. We still have a long way to go between now and December and now in February. But the class of 2023, I think it's going to go down as one of the most important in Miami history. All right, we get some questions more about the class of 2024. We get a question about Malik Bryant, one of my favorite members of the class of 2023, the four-star linebacker out of Jones High School in Orlando. And, you know, people want to know what's the most important game Miami has to win this year, must win games this season. Keep it locked to Locked on Canes. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. Uh, we're going to be talking later on this week with Larry Bluestein from South Florida High School Sports at 560 WQAM. We're going to talk with Brian Smith later on this week, and who knows what else we're going to cook up this week on Locked on Canes. All right, we get a question from... Let's see. Uh, oh, from from Mobile, Alabama, from Cool K seventy seven, who says, "Hey, lifelong Canes fan from Mobile, but I now reside in Delaware." All right, so from Mobile. By the way, Delaware. You can tell me if I'm wrong, Cool K. Uh, but I, like twenty years ago, my cousin, who was uh, in the Air Force, there's a big Air Force base in Dover. He got married there in Delaware. Only time I've been to Delaware, we went to my cousin's wedding at the Air Force base. I remember driving through that state. I've never been that bored in my entire life. <laughs> like nothing going on in Delaware. <laughs> you tell me if I'm wrong, but in my, I drove, it's not a very big state to begin with. I've driven through most of the state seemed to me like an incredibly boring place. Maybe I'm missing out on all the Delaware hot spots. You tell me if I'm wrong, but it looked incredibly boring there in Delaware. Uh, but he says, my question is, do you think Malik Bryant will see the field his freshman season? I saw a recent picture of him and he's huge. Yeah, uh, I've raved about Malik because, you know, I, I was uh, he, he didn't play in the spring game because he had a, a minor injury. But I was a few feet away from Malik in the spring game. And I'm like, this dude is gigantic. Um, when I was at Legends Camp a few weeks ago, we were doing interviews in the weight room. Malik Bryant was in there working out. Uh, he is incredibly strong and he looks physically. You'd never guess this is an 18 year old incoming freshman. You'd think 20, 21 year old veteran. Uh, and of course, if you watch his high school tape, He's a lethal pass rusher, and he seems to have the size and the explosion. I think you're going to find a role for him in his true freshman season. I don't expect him to be a starter, but I think you're going to find ways to get Malik Bryant on the field. So to answer your question, yes, I think he's going to make himself a factor this year. Um, now, we get a similar question, but this is on the class of 2024. Who uh, This is from UD Stacks, who says, hey, if we keep everyone from this 24 class, what players do you see starting for us as true freshmen? Here's how I'm going to answer this question, and I feel strongly about this. None. 
And I don't mean that to disparage the class. I mean that as a compliment to the way Miami's roster is trending. Hopefully none of the class of 24 players start as true freshmen. Because Miami added so much talent in 2023 to build depth. And these guys, the 2023 guys, will be in their second year when the 24s come in. Miami has brought in so much transfer portal depth at most positions that now maybe, okay, here could be an exception, right? But you're talking about players who have already verbally committed. You know, if if Miami gets a couple of these blue chip defense and Artavius Jones is obviously very good. I, I He's a blue chip guy in my eyes. He's a four star. You know, if Miami can also add, you know, a Kamari and Franklin and maybe another top guy like an Aiden Breland to this class. That could be the area because you're, you're going to have some defensive tackles moving on uh, after this coming season. You're going to have a lot of roster openings. So maybe, maybe one of those defensive tackles uh, could find their way into the starting lineup. But overall, you should have enough depth in the 2024 season. You should have enough depth by then that if you have any true freshman or more than one true freshman starting for you at any position outside of maybe cl- place kicker if Abram Murray is ready to start and if Bora Gallus moves on by that point if you have anyone starting outside of place kicker as a true freshman I think that's an indictment on Miami's depth you should not have any of these guys none of these guys should have to start Uh, we get a question from Andy in Pembroke Pines who says if you could only win one of these games next year against Texas A&M Clemson or Florida State which one would you choose to win I feel like you're trying to corner me into something here Andy you sure you're a Canes fan? You're not like a Gator spy or something? Because I, I feel like you're trying to make me admit that only winning one of those games is a possibility. <laughs> but I will indulge, okay? Some people I've seen say if you can only win one of those games, you beat Texas A&M because it's a home game early in the season, and that can help like really um, put you on a good track in recruiting and could build some excitement. But no. <coughs> The only correct answer there, if I if I can only win one of those games, it's got to be Florida State, right? You know, those guys humiliated us last year, and their fans do not stop chirping, which is their right. It's a rivalry. When we beat them, we chirp. They beat us. They chirp. It is what it is. I do not want to endure another year of Florida State fan chirping. So if, if we can only win one of those games, you go on the road to Tallahassee. I'm sure Florida State will be favored in that game. Uh, They should have a good team this year. Miami wins that game. Uh, I'm going to be sleeping very, very well. Okay, so if I had to choose one of those, that would be the one that I choose. But my real choice is I want to beat all three of those teams. I want to beat all three of those teams, and I want to have a a top three recruiting class when it's all said and done, because winning all three, winning all three of those games would probably help you do that. All right. See, I have time for probably one more question. The fan base doesn't stop talking about this. So I definitely want to get to this one. Dono, some of these Adidas designs are whack. Do you miss Nike with Miami? That comes from James. Yeah, I see all these Miami fans. So they they put out these new Adidas Ultra Boost shoes, which I think look pretty good. All right. But then I see some fans are like, what is that? Those are ugly. Those are some ugly shoes. What are, what are they doing here? I miss Nike. I want Nike back. Uh, now, guys, if you know me, you know. I don't care about stripes and swooshes. I care about wins and losses, right? Miami could be wearing, they could wear their training camp jerseys on game day, beat up with helmets, with scratches. If you win on Saturdays, I do not care what you look like. I don't care what shoes you're wearing. I don't care what jersey. I just want to win again. But I'm going to answer the question because I have a strong opinion. Despite the fact I don't care what gear they wear as long as they win, I'm going to answer the question because... Folks, if you forget what the days of Nike were like with Miami, Nike was mailing it in. There's a reason why Miami switched to Adidas when they had the chance, right? No matter what you think of their gear, Adidas actually treats Miami like a priority. Nike treated Miami like an afterthought. Here's a good example of this. Uh, I saw a tweet from friend of the show, Malik Rozier, former Miami Hurricanes quarterback. Because remember, Rozier, he started at Miami at the end of the Nike era and into the beginning of the Adidas era. era. So he, he was around for both, for Nike and Adidas. And Malik Rozier tweeted, as, an, as a fan, Nike, but as a player, Adidas. Nike is OD selfish, he said. Like, I remember my freshman year, 
they would even give us extra, they wouldn't even give us extra lifting shorts or shirts because Nike didn't give them enough. Adidas gave me so much, I had to give it away to my family. So I'm rocking with Adidas. I'm telling you, man, from a promotional standpoint, just from a generosity standpoint with the gear and coming out with a lot of different new designs and shoes, Adidas has been a better partner for Miami than Nike was. And I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Folks, make sure if you're watching us on YouTube, hit the like button, hit that thumbs up, subscribe to our channel. If you're listening to the audio version, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey, Google, wherever you get your pods, make sure to leave us a five-star review. And we'll talk to you again next time on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.